Chaos. I'm here to kill Chaos. That's my mission. Looks like Chaos has been waiting for us. I only know one thing. I want to kill Chaos. I need to. It's not a hope or a dream. It's like a hunger. This is the Shrine of Chaos. He's here. We just have to hunt him down. The darkness is so thick I can taste it. This is it. No, wait, stop. You go over there, you go over there, you go over there, you go over there, you go over there. No! Hey, Jack. Huh? When did you teach Sarah that song? It's a classic. Everyone knows it. Boy, oh boy. I've been waiting for this one for a long time. I can't believe we made it to the PS5, the modern era of gaming. For the first time on Refoid, we can't connect the dots to see where Final Fantasy is going to take us because we just don't know where it's going now. Today, we're talking about the most recent original concept spinoff, even though it's not entirely original because it is connected to that first game. It's also the first game that was announced and released during this show. That's how old the show is already. <laughs> so by that time, I was into the Final Fantasy news cycle. I think I was playing 4 at the time or something like that, and E3 was coming up. I remember the first rumors of this game. An article came out just a day or two before E3, and this was like probably the last E3, and it said Square Enix is planning on reimagining the first game in the series, which I had just played a couple months ago into a modern Dark Souls-esque action game called Final Fantasy Origin. That sounded like a genius idea to me. The game design philosophy of Dark Souls kind of already is what if you took these very, very old games and made a modern version of that without modernizing it, so to speak. That's why those games are so revered. There's no tutorial, there's not a very clear story, there's not a ton of dialogue, there's not overbearing UI elements, there's barely any direction. You're just supposed to just go and experience it for yourself and die a lot until you get good. In the 80s, that's kind of what every game was. So to take Final Fantasy 1 and make it its own new style open world RPG, without any of the hand-holding or any of that stuff, just like, throw yourself into it. It would be Final Fantasy's own Breath of the Wild. It would be revolutionary. My imagination was running wild. And then the game was officially revealed. I only know one thing. I want to kill Chaos. This is the Shrine of Chaos. Chaos. I become Chaos. <clears throat> The full title was now Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin, and it made waves that E3 for its highly memeable trailer. At the time, it was the biggest meme in the Final Fantasy series, and to this day, is still referenced by fans whether they've played it or not. I myself have put that one soundbite into so many episodes of Refoid, basically whenever I mention chaos. chaos. Because all you need to know about this to get the joke is that the guy says chaos a lot. Chaos has been waiting for us. You gonna make us go in there and f You're dust! Interesting. It's a lot different than I thought it was gonna... Chaos is here? Yeah. It was gonna look. The darkness is so thick I can taste it. The darkness is, is so thick you can taste it? Darkness is so thick I can taste it. <laughs> the darkness is so thick I can taste it. Bro, what? <laughs> the dialogue is so corny. The anime noises they make are so silly. And also, why is this guy in a normal ass t-shirt fighting through medieval RPG worlds? Wait a minute, the darkness is so thick he can taste it? The memory of their struggle buried deep within their hearts? Ah, Namura-san. Fancy meeting you here. 
So this is not quite the game that rumor led us to believe it would be. It is a Souls-like in a way, but it's stage-based. There isn't as much environmental storytelling as there are secret lore files you pick up and read a la the Ansem reports. You'll find this game being compared much more accurately to Neo, another popular Souls-like developed by the same studio, Team Ninja Koei Tecmo, continuing their Square partnership since making the last two Dissidia games. I have not played Neo, so apologies for that, but I will stick to my normie Dark Souls comparisons, thank you. So what is Stranger of Paradise? Is it a remake of Final Fantasy 1 after all? Why is it called that? Well, in typical Nomura fashion, we won't be able to answer any of those questions until later on. The only thing we know is, we need to kill chaos. It's not a hope or a dream. It's like a hunger. I'm happy to report that the trailer was not a misleading or exaggerated representation of the final product. Jack acts exactly like he does in that trailer in about every scene. He's blunt, he doesn't listen to people, he has one single purpose in life, and he makes sure you know it. He's accompanied by two other guys named Jed and Ash. They also need to kill Chaos. The three of them bump into each other as they're approaching Castle Cornelia to ask the king if they can hunt Chaos. Oh, whoa, we all want to hunt Chaos? Did we just become best friends? So they group up right there forever and they go to the Chaos Shrine to kill Chaos. The story is not the focus of the game. It seems to want to get itself over with as quickly as possible. Sometimes cutscenes feel like they end before a conversation is finished, as if they're like, yeah, we communicated the main info we needed, so you don't need to watch this anymore, moving on. There are a few times, including that scene where the three boys meet, where it fades to black and explains a bunch of stuff that happens off screen instead of showing us. You'll get a short introduction cutscene at the start of a main story mission, then a bit of actual plot development at the end. I guess what I'm trying to say is, if you were looking for a lot of funny scenes with ridiculous dialogue, there aren't truly that many. And if you're looking for actual character development, oh man, there's absolutely none of that in this game. You will learn next to nothing about Jed and Ash, nor will you witness the group get closer to each other as friends until the game decides to get all sentimental towards the end. Two other party members join you along the way, Neon and Sophia. They're equally as flat and memorable as the other two. I didn't hate anyone in this squad, but I didn't really think anything of them for most of the journey. Part of that is due to the lack of focus on that sort of thing, and the other is Jack's brutishly cold and unyielding demeanor. As the only playable character, he is your role in this role-playing game, and if someone tries talking to him about something that isn't chaos, he will literally walk away from them mid-conversation. Bullshit. They try to make up for this a bit with characters discussing some stuff about the current level you're playing or reacting to a battle you just won, but how many times can you hear the same, phew that was rough, before you start to get annoyed? Koei Tecmo has this attitude where they'll make a character say the same line every single time something happens and they will act like that's totally okay and not annoying. <laughs> I remember somebody giving me flack for praising this type of dialogue in Final Fantasy XV because they didn't feel like it was that unique. Tons of games have this sort of thing. And while that's true, and you definitely get repeated lines in 15 as well, it's all about execution. The best part of how it works in 15 is that there are times when they'll say nothing, there is that natural human inconsistency to it, and there are so many more things to interact with that all present different dialogue. In Stranger of Paradise, you're basically just fighting things, and someone says that one line they are programmed to say every single time a specific thing happens. It's like, come on. Every time you use a potion, you get a comment. Hey Jack, don't use too many of those. Hey Jack, don't use too many of those. Hey Jack, don't... It's like, shut up man, I'm dying and I need to heal. It also felt like they were programmed to give that few, that was rough, battle conclusion dialogue, even if you lose, like, just a little bit of health. Like, they're only satisfied with the fight if you do it perfectly. And the only reason I bring up 15 again is because Jed is distractingly similar to Prompto. His dialogue, his delivery, the laid-back, jokey role he plays in the group, it was so Prompto. Yet I didn't care about him nearly as much, because you don't learn much about these characters. And there are only two other NPCs you interact with outside of levels. 
Astos, a dark elf who helps you track chaos but might not be trustworthy due to his mysterious past, and Princess Sarah, the only character actually from Final Fantasy 1. The story is to simply go through these levels on the hunt for chaos. The plot was not as high a priority as the gameplay, so let's jump into that. I've waited two years to talk about Final Fantasy Dark Souls, or Final Fantasy Neo, I guess, whatever. Swing big sword, roll on floor, occasionally guard stuff. Is this peak gaming? But wait, there's more. A lot more. The stagger bar makes another return in a new form now called the break gauge. Instead of draining a health bar all the way, often the most effective way to kill is to drain the break gauge by continually laying attacks on the enemy so it doesn't have a chance to recover. Draining it all the way allows Jack to charge in and instantly finish it off in a quite satisfying, brutal fashion. This makes it very tempting to just go berserk on someone who will rightfully punish you for trying that. As always with these games, patience will be the most important lesson you learn. I liked how guarding was much more effective than what I'm used to in Dark Souls. Sometimes it blocks damage entirely or just takes break gauge damage instead. Oh yeah, you have one of those too. Sometimes enemies can drain it, other times you can drain it by using risky abilities. It recovers fairly quickly, but if it ever goes all the way down, you get staggered for a while and that sort of thing is a death sentence in a boss battle. High risk, high reward is the name of the game, especially when it comes to my favorite mechanic, the Soul Shield. The Soul Shield is its own dedicated button in addition to your dodge and guard buttons. Holding it down will block any one instance of damage at a time, but it will drain your break gauge in seconds. Basically, you want to just tap it right before something hits you and no sooner. This is such an important mechanic because it is your main way of increasing your max MP when you succeed. There's a very interesting twist on the usual MP bar in this game. Just about every special ability uses MP, but very special abilities might even lower the bar's max capacity. You definitely don't want to do that too much. And it's also your main penalty for dying. You don't want to do that too much either. There's no Dark Souls death equivalent in this one. You don't have to try and get back to where you died to pick up your lost souls or anything, which is nice, but losing max MP can still hurt real bad. When I was still finding my footing in this game and encountered a particularly tough boss, I was thinking this mechanic was too unforgiving. Because technically, as a result of me dying, the fight was now going to be harder. And it would get a little harder and harder every time I died because I'd have less MP to help me out. This was the Tiamat fight, by the way. I'm wondering if anyone else had the same experience. That fight felt like the game was pushing me out of the bird's nest for the first time. It forced me to engage with mechanics I was ignoring, like the soul shield. Instead of throwing myself at it over and over, I would spend time practicing absorbing its MP with well-timed shields. Even if I die again, I'd end up with more MP than I started the previous attempt with. And eventually, after learning patience, after studying my enemy's moves, only then did I best her in battle. And that is the Souls-like satisfaction I was looking for. The problem with the Souls game's risk-reward system is that it all hinges on one life. You really, really, really don't want to lose all your souls and your humanity. But if that happens, all the stakes are gone. Death no longer matters all that much. Stranger of Paradise chooses to instead make every life matter a little bit, and that's just a cool new perspective to approach this genre from. You ever have a particularly bad run in Dark Souls and just decide to let the boss kill you because it's hopeless? That never really happened to me because the longer I stayed in the fight, the better off I'd be for the next attempt, even if I knew it was going to be a loss. I could get that MP up for the next time. Side note, there's a settings option to disable cutscenes you've already seen, so that means you can jump right into the fight again instead of having to press skip every time. One of those mechanics that makes you wonder why it isn't in every game. Anyway, so you use MP for combos, command abilities, and unique job abilities. That's right, there's a job system, and it's very good. We'll get to that in a sec. Combos are usually scary to me. If you're the type of person to get overwhelmed when hit with a big list of buttons you're expected to learn to play a character, no worries here. You only have a small handful of very simple combos that are the exact same no matter what you have equipped, and to be honest, I didn't use half of them. The cool part is that you assign which moves you want to each combo as you unlock them so it's all nice and intuitive to learn. 
You're not going to be mashing random buttons, you'll probably find a move you'll like and spam it. Plus, combos always end with Y, and your Y button prompt in the corner will change depending on which combo you're doing, which is a neat touch. Command abilities are brought up using the left trigger and tapping A, B, X, or Y. You'll unlock a slew of them, and they're very powerful too. The main one you'll always have is the Lightbringer, which gives you temporary infinite break gauge with a huge increase to break damage. It's kind of a typical rage mode type of thing, but it's very useful. I put off the coolest thing for last. Some moves enemies use will be highlighted in purple. This indicates that said move can be copied if you absorb the attack with Soul Shield. You'll usually get one or two uses to execute for free whenever you want. And that's just fun! What a great way to encourage players to get used to a very important ability they have. You're like Kirby over here waiting to see which enemies give you what. And the key to defeating certain bosses often lies with using their own attack against them at the right time. Every button on this controller provides something you need to master to get good at this game. It's a tightly crafted action RPG. I think Souls-like fans will have a great time with it. But the developers didn't forget that this is a Final Fantasy game, and they want to appeal to those fans too. And that's why, unlike most Souls games, Stranger of Paradise has difficulty options. Action is the normal difficulty I played on the whole time, hard is the typical everything is worse mode, and story is for people who are not as interested in getting good. And you can even enable casual story mode if you really just want to cruise through. Rest assured, if this type of game scares you, you will be able to get through it somehow. But I will say, if you are at least half decent at video games, I can't imagine story mode being any fun. Everything I just said about the game forcing you to learn it so you can overcome tough battles through your own skill, that's out the window when you just kill everything. But some people are into that, so whatever, you do you. It's an endless hot debate in the community on whether or not these games should have difficulty levels. I personally think accessibility is important, but on the other hand, I would always rather take a game that doesn't need to split itself into different modes to be appealing to all. It feels like action mode is what they settled on for the game, and the other two are arbitrarily scaled to make the experience less fun. Now, remember me saying that for later. Speaking of Final Fantasy fans, there's much more for you to love in this game that we barely even talked about yet, and one of the biggest things is the job system. Translating a classic Final Fantasy job system for a real-time action game was a very intriguing prospect. Especially since you're mostly on your own. You got two party members with you, but you don't interact with them or control them outside of one command that basically tells them to go all out. But they have assigned jobs and equipment all the same. It's just that synergy with a team is not something that matters at all here. That idea that something like White Mage is only for support, that's not really how this game goes about it. Every job is made to work for a solo player. They each have access to a certain number of various weapon types in the game, and whichever weapon you equip is really what determines your attack actions. Your job affects your stats, but the only other important thing it changes is giving you access to one special unique ability. I love a job system that encourages you to experiment instead of expecting you to stick with one or two the whole game. And because this game doesn't want you to structure a team around specific types of jobs, you can use whatever you want and switch whenever you want. It actually encourages you to spend an equal amount of time with each of them because to unlock new jobs, you have to get to the end of some other job skill trees, which doesn't take that long, and a lot of the unlockable jobs are just straight upgrades of old ones. So by the end, I got enough quality time with every single job in the game, and that has never happened to me before. You can have two equipped at the same time and swap with the push of a button, so there's a whole other form of experimentation looking for which jobs work as a pair. You start with the basic ones. Once you fill out the mage tree, you unlock white and black mage. If you also complete the sword fighter tree, you unlock red mage as well. Filling out both white and black will unlock sage, which is basically white and black rolled into one. It's a super satisfying and rewarding structure. Since I did get time with all of them, I'm gonna run through some of my favorites now. That Sage job just gives you access to so much. Being able to use black magic attacks and being able to heal also is just like perfect for me. It was probably my most equipped job. Berserker works as it usually does in Final Fantasy, as you might expect. High damage given and taken. But it's so much more fun in an action game context because you are the one actually going berserk. Thief was never a job I 
really understood in the traditional games. Like, I'm gonna waste a whole class slot so that my guy can steal like a hundred gil from a goblin. It never felt worth it. I was never a thief fan. Well, there's no gil in this game. Thief steals enemy abilities for you to throw back at them without the need for soul shield. That's fun. Now you made thief fun. The breaker job lets you use Zantetsuken, which can instant kill enemies, causing them to explode, but you have to charge it for a while. It's not the easiest to pull off, but it's silly, and when it works out, it's really fun. Assassin is awesome. Whenever you critical hit an enemy, you add a marker to it. Note that any hit in the back has a 100% crit chance. You can stack this effect so many times, then with the push of a button, the enemy gets sliced for every mark you had on them. Last but not least, this was added in one of the DLCs. Gun. We've had gun classes before. Squall's Gunblade, Yuna's Dual Pistols, Vincent's Cerberus. But outside of Dirge, where the whole game was a shooter, these classes never truly represented how a gun shooting class should feel in my opinion. Probably because it would mess with the game's focus on close combat. Stranger of Paradise says, nope, we're letting you straight up aim and shoot a gun with infinite ammo to fight enemies who mostly aren't built to handle projectiles. You are clearly not supposed to have this level of ranged attack. Guns can allow you to just drain an enemy's life bar without entering its aggro area, so it doesn't even notice you before it dies. It's very cheap, but it's hilarious. And guns aren't limited to the marksman job. For some reason, sages are allowed to use guns? Once I found that out, sage was pretty much a lock-in for me. And because I switched my jobs up at the start of pretty much every level, I was constantly rethinking my approaches to fights. I swear, I didn't just shoot everything in the face the whole time. Some jobs were harder to figure out than others, but each one of them provides a small change that you can base your entire strategy on, and you're truly free to experiment as much as you want. Finally, I feel so validated for my complaints about certain job systems we've tackled before. This one is just great. There are a lot more nuances to the gameplay, such as switching jobs right after a parry lets you instantly perform an action with the new job, little complex things like that. I can't go over every detail, but I should talk about equipment a little bit. In some games, equipment is the most important thing about your build. In others, you just kind of throw on whatever you find. In this game, it is pretty important, but if you don't want to care, you don't have to, which is great news for me, at least to a point. All of the loot, all of the reason for going off the beaten path is in hope of finding rare equipment. They all have item levels and also rarity levels. They change your stats and they have special effects that boost resistances or damage or something. This part of the game is for those who love to tweak. You can tweak and tweak and tweak your build and grind those side missions for hours and hours until you find that perfect item that synergizes with your build. You will have a field day with this game if that's what you're into. Or if you play on hard mode, this is something you probably should get into. This is a topic I've talked about a lot. I really don't enjoy when the challenge is based on how much you've grinded or how high your level is rather than your actual skill in the game. But I feel that way even stronger when it comes to real-time action games. I'd really rather not bother with any of this. Thank God for the optimize equipment button. Not as good as the human touch, but good enough for getting back into the action quick. The only thing you actually should manually look out for is job affinity. Having a large percentage of job affinity will drastically increase the experience points you gain for that job, as well as give you access to multiple, quite useful bonus abilities for that job when passing certain thresholds. If you want to get through every job before the game ends, definitely pick out equipment with good affinity. Sometimes it's hard to keep track since the game drowns you with equipment. You're only allowed to keep up to 600 armor pieces and 600 weapons in your inventory at once. Yeah, only 600. You'll get that much in just a few levels, so you'll need to visit the smithy who can dismantle some of the junk and give you upgrade materials in return. Every new main mission will give you better items than the last one, so honestly, I never bothered upgrading anything. This is also why Jack and the gang look so different in every cutscene, because they're wearing whatever I threw on at the time. There were some cutscenes that accidentally showed up in my underwear. 
How embarrassing. There's an option to disable headgear too, so you never miss out on Jack's beautiful face. But yeah, this is a very looty game. They later even added an option to automatically dismantle items under a certain threshold because they knew people were annoyed with doing it after every mission. To be honest, this whole part of the game felt a little mobile gamey in nature and was a, a huge turnoff for me. But again, you can mostly ignore it. At least for now. Hey, did I mention this game can be played entirely online with friends? That is incredible! And it's not the awkward Dark Souls type multiplayer with the summon stones or anything like that. You can just host a game and have your friends join you at any time. They'll take control of one of Jack's party members and will help you out. Now it makes sense why there's very little interaction with these guys in battle. I think they were expecting you to bring friends along. I don't really have anything to say about the multiplayer aside from that's very cool and I didn't know about it before playing. Unfortunately, I didn't have the pleasure of experiencing it myself. I don't know anyone who owns this game, especially on Epic Game Store. Yeah, I know, I know, but it was just so much cheaper there. Give me a break. You can join random public games, but no, you can't. Not anymore. It's been a year and change since the final DLC came out. People beat it and moved on. It's dead in the dirt. But if what I said about the gameplay seems fun to you and a friend looking for a new Souls-like to play together, I think this would be a great one. That's everything about the gameplay experience worth talking about. Or is it? We're about to get into some cool stuff involving the story. It is a little spoilery, but personally I'm very, very happy I didn't know about it going in. It was the coolest surprise in the whole game for me. We're going to talk about the stages and what they are. You've been warned. So the first main level in the story is the Chaos Shrine. They do the thing where they're silhouetted across Cornelia Castle and they go through the shrine to fight Garland, who claimed to be Chaos. It's all Final Fantasy 1 stuff. This leads them on a quest to discover the real chaos, which involves defeating the four fiends and completing challenges to show their worthiness. But the world they traverse is different than the one in the original Final Fantasy. This world, crafted by Lufenians, has vastly different environmental areas, all based off various dimensions. The first one you visit felt vaguely familiar to me, a bluish cave with big glowing crystals leading to a cove where you fight what's Probably pirates? This is Sustasha! This is the first dungeon from A Realm Reborn. In the loading screen, before you start, it said this area was based off Dimension 14. I thought, okay, that's a specific number, but it took me a while before I was like, no, what is it about this place? I'm getting strange deja vu, and then it hit me. This game is about to get extremely cool. There are conveniently 15 levels in the game. I wonder where else we'll go. The next level is from 2, which is difficult to recognize because of the difference in graphics, but I still felt the dour vibes of that game. The level after was a little hard to match, it was some kind of jungly area. But then I started changing weather patterns to access new areas when the background noise hit me. That's when I knew I was experiencing something special. I've never felt so catered to as someone who marathoned the series. Every main line is represented as its own level. Some choices are obvious, such as the Crystal Tower from Final Fantasy III, of course it's gonna be that. But for the most part, these areas they choose seem to be intentionally not the most iconic area from those games. You find out later that Jack is having his memory wiped constantly, so that all he knows is this persistent feeling of having to kill chaos. It's possible he's been to all these places before, and this is just another cycle he'll forget when it's over with. The party makes comments about these areas feeling familiar, but they don't know why. The same way we, the player, skim through memories of our past adventures as we walk through. Even when we know which area and which game, the replication is never perfect. They could have copied the way textures looked. They could have ported over textures from the newer ones, 
but they made new textures that specifically aren't exactly the same as they were. The structure of these levels sometimes feels similar for a while, but then it stops. The whole experience is like having a dream about a place you know, but your brain is reconstructing it from memory alone and it's not quite right. It's uncanny. You feel like a stranger. The music is all original, not just ripped from those games, but it's different depending on how far into the level you are. Getting to explore the Citadel from 15 was a special treat since we never really could in any of the entries from that universe. At first, the music sounds fairly generic, but as you climb the Citadel higher and higher, all of a sudden, ever so subtly, you hear a familiar tune. When you reach the Seven inspired area, even the characters in the game get excited. I've been waiting for this. Same. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not based on Midgar, it's not Shinra Tower, it's the underwater Junon Reactor. And the music sounds as if somebody is trying to play the classic Mako Reactor track, but they keep forgetting the notes or something. <laughs> <laughs> We are. Every level is like this. It kind of makes you feel like you're going crazy. Weird. It feels like I've been here before. I've had that feeling before. And it's best not to think about it. But it's hands down the coolest thing this game does. One of those experiences you won't forget. Let me tell you, I was not expecting to feel this way about the funny man says chaos game. I won't spoil the rest of the areas, but the game is worth it just to see them all. But where do these paths lead? Do we find chaos? What is this game actually about? It's time to discuss the plot. When are we gonna fight chaos? We've talked about the basics, but we're gonna dive deeper and solve all the mysteries the game began with. Spoilers only continue from here. I didn't mention that before heading to the chaos shrine, Princess Sarah asks if you can look out for an old friend of hers named Garland. As seen in the trailer, he's the boss of that level, but when you beat him, he turns out to be another warrior of light named Neon. And this is when she joins your party. She turned into that when she became obsessed with chaos and the obsession took her over. She starts to question what we're all doing here and if chaos is even real. Jack's like, shut up idiot, of course he's real, and they go off together, eventually meeting up with Sophia to complete the party of five. Oh, also, remember, this is the second M-rated Final Fantasy game, so there's blood and high violence and all that, but I'm happier to report they finally said it. That season will never come. It will remain a dream so long as I live. Who I am, I don't give a fuck who you are. Some of the cutscenes have major frame drops, and according to people online, it's because the models are practically uncompressed with basically no optimization. It had issues even on PS5 too, so they were just not very great at optimizing the cutscenes in this game. I don't know if it was ever fixed, but I'm just warning you PC gamers out there. Anyway, on their search, they get help from that dark elf Astos who leads them to killing the four fiends, which is basically the bulk of the game. Between stages, you get short flashback cutscenes with Jack in a grassy field or a futuristic all-white room talking to a Lufenian. Lufenians, if you don't remember, are the high society sky people who tend to take control of the constant struggle between light and dark. In these flashbacks, Jack accepts some kind of offer that involves taking a dark crystal and bringing it with him on missions, but the crystal always wipes his memory at the end. Not only that, but they also implant memories in his mind too. Memories of nothing but the desire to kill Chaos. 
That's why he's like this. He's meant to have no emotion, so he's unable to give into it. If you explore levels, you can come across little pieces to the puzzle, but all will be revealed in a matter of time. After defeating the fiends, Astos reveals he was a clone replica the Lufenians use as a reconnaissance unit who accompanied Jack on a lot of his missions, and that the reason all these monsters attack Cornelia is because the Lufenians use it as a dumping ground for failed darkness experiments. This upsets the balance, and when there's too much darkness, chaos can emerge. So they hit the emergency reset button, trapping Cornelia in a time loop much like the original game. But sometimes they want to continue their experiments to see how far they can push them. This is when they send chosen agents to run through places and wipe out the darkness. These agents are called the Strangers. Strangers from another Lufenian realm called Paradise. The realm of grassy fields where Frank Sinatra's My Way is always playing for some reason. They adopted the name Warriors of Light, but they are not the ones prophesized to save the world. Through many cycles, Astos became good friends with Jack and the squad as they concocted a plan together to take back Cornelia. Jack's memories get wiped, but not Astos. So even though his friends didn't remember, Astos began pulling the strings cycle after cycle to get them strong enough to eventually fight the Lufenians back. Jack also fell in love with Sarah and that friend named Garland she was asking about was actually him. His last name is Garland. Jack Garland. And towards the end of this cycle, when fighting through waves of monsters invading Cornelia, it was time for the last step of the plan. Sarah gets killed by the overwhelming forces and Jack feels a rush of dark emotions overcome him for the first time. His friends look at each other and agree to attack him, forcing him to give in to those emotions and absorb their darkness too. He becomes all powerful and the final level is the Chaos Shrine again, but you sprint through it with infinite break and high damage, jumping into a portal at the end to reach a Lufenian research station where all the overflow darkness manifests in one final being. Chaos. So you out chaos chaos, you absorb chaos to become chaos, steal the Lufenian's ability to reset time, and now all that's left is chaos. The world is saved from Lufenian control, but the land is still shrouded in darkness. Your four friends become the four fiends, and Jack is now the final boss. He retires to his throne, knowing this world can only be saved when the true warriors of light come to destroy him. And so the stage is set for the story of the original Final Fantasy. For the most part. I I'm not really here to scrutinize plot holes. I love this though. Reframing an NES game story into a modern RPG sort of story is actually a really fun idea. Giving Garland an entire game of backstory suddenly turns him into one of the cooler Final Fantasy villains in my book. Between this and Dissidia, Final Fantasy 1 is like a completely different universe now. I think that game stands first in line on my list of entries I want to replay from this show. Kingdom Hearts fans will feel very at home with this sort of plot that plays out here. It feels very Birth by Sleep-esque. But I would remind you again, story is not a huge focus. There is about two hours of cutscenes in the whole thing, so I wouldn't really get this game for the story alone if you're not into the gameplay too. Most of that cheesy, over-the-top dialogue everyone was joking about feels pretty intentional. Like, Jack is supposed to be this angry, violent guy who only wants one thing. He's Garland. His emotions were taken away. He's not supposed to be this fun adventurer you want to hang out with, which really makes him stand apart from all the other protagonists in this series. I fully enjoyed my time with Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin. I mean, come on, you got Frank Sinatra over the credits, you got me. You can't do wrong with Frank Sinatra over the credits, you know? But I know what's coming. Some of you might know what's coming. If you haven't played this game, maybe you don't. But this game has DLC. If you're satisfied with the review, you can go ahead and skip to the conclusion. You could go on with your day. Because we're done discussing the base game. That was all good. But from this point on in the video, I'm gonna get angry. I'm just saying, I'm just letting you know. Because everything 
I praised about the difficulty, about the satisfying character growth parts of the game. Every gameplay direction that I liked is about to take a complete 180. Completing the game unlocks a new difficulty called Chaos Mode. It's even harder than hard, makes everything way worse. No thank you, I'm not that much of a masochist. If you bought the DLC, you'll also unlock the first mission of DLC 1, Trials of the Dragon King. But oop, this mission can only be played on Chaos difficulty. Oh no! Oh god! The first mission is just an introduction to the story. Basically, Bahamut wants to test your might. To prove your strength to him, you must undergo his trials, acquire rat tails, and stuff just like he made you do in Final Fantasy 1. That's all. But yes, from here on out, you must play everything on the new very hard mode. Sounds like it's gonna be painful. When you beat that prologue level, you unlock... What? Bahamut difficulty? A mode for players who have fully glutted themselves on chaos mode and are looking for an extremely hard challenge? No. I literally just got chaos mode. Oh, sorry, scratch what I said earlier. From here on out, you actually must play everything on the newer, very, very hard Bahamut difficulty. By the way, what actually are the Trials of the Dragon King? They are simply gameplay modifiers you must turn on to increase the difficulty even more. This could lower HP, increase how fast gauges drain, increase enemy HP and attack. Basically everything bad can just be made worse. The more modifiers you have upon beating a level, the more dragon coins you'll earn. Your job is to collect an arbitrary amount of said dragon coins to unlock a handful of dialogue with Bahamut before he tells you to go collect more. That's the entire DLC. No new levels are added. You are just repeating levels you already played, except now you die in one hit and don't do damage to anything. I paid extra for this? I mean, I don't need to sit here and rant to you about how insane this is to do to your player base. But I will. This content is built only for the hardest of hardcores and no one else. I think this game sold decently well and I explained before how it doesn't alienate certain Final Fantasy fans who might not be used to a game like this by providing lower difficulty levels. What the devs are basically saying with this season pass is Oh, you liked our game? Well, that's great, that's flattering. You, you wanna pay more? For more of our game? That's great, hey, here you go. Also, mm, mm, fuck you. And I can hear some of you already saying, oh, get good, get good. That's what these games are. You said it yourself, get good. No, no, you don't understand. If this really was just harder, I would deal with it. I would throw myself at that boss over and over till I learned it and figured it out. You know, Dark Souls. But where I draw the line is when it's not just about skill anymore. It is almost entirely about your equipment level, your job level, your character build that you have to grind for. Don't get me wrong, even if you have the build, it's still very hard, but it is almost impossible if you don't have the exact specific equipment that you need for that specific fight. You now have to become an expert on the meta of Stranger of Paradise. The grind isn't just about collecting dragon coins, it's about tracking down equipment and upgrade materials for hours and hours on end until you outfit yourself perfectly to even have a chance at beating this boss. But it's not just equipment. You'll also have to buy increased level caps for your jobs, which now have two additional skill trees that use new, rarer materials to unlock. Experimentation is now no longer encouraged. Stick with your perfect build and grind it to be good. Switching to a new job will never be as powerful and equipment might not work with it. That means a lot more grinding for nothing. Through the course of the main story, I played every single job just to feel them all out and unlock more. I had fun with all of them. But in the DLC, 
I could basically only work with the two I wanted unless I want to stick around forever. Even after unlocking the extra added jobs like Summoner and Blue Mage, I couldn't do anything with them anymore. You can also pay materials to increase the level cap of the levels themselves. For me, there's just no entertainment value to this at all. What was wrong with how the rest of the entire base game worked? I fight a boss? Is hard? I overcome it. Gameplay loop. Now it's, I fight a boss, I get killed in one hit, I can't even chop a smidge of HP off, I grind for 10 hours, and then the fight is the normal level of hard that the base game was. It's just a massive time sink to get to the same point that the rest of the game already was! This is everything wrong with RPGs. This is the perfect example of that argument people bring about experience points mattering more than skill. What is a game if you're just putting hours in until you basically hit the threshold of now you're able to kill and then that's, that's it? That's the game? I mean, this is mobile gotcha game power creep. Like, why would you retroactively add that to a perfectly normal game? And look, if that's how the whole game was, fine. I would accept it. I would say, fine, this game's not for me, as I've done on this show before. But it's the way the DLC hard contrasts the actual game. The way it just says, fuck you if you played on normal mode. Normal mode. Actually, it screws you over if you played on hard mode, too. I can't get over the description of Bahamut mode difficulty that with the way it says, this is for people who glutted themselves on chaos mode. Like, how am I supposed to glut myself on this mode that I just unlocked at the exact same time as I unlocked Bahamut mode. It's like you'll only be ready for this if you got this game on launch, beat it, unlocked chaos mode, and liked it so much you wanted to replay the whole game in chaos mode, and then like 100% completed it, basically just kept playing this game until the DLC came out, and then you'd be ready. Everybody else for the rest of time is just gonna unlock these two modes at the same moment and not know what the hell to do. They crafted this content for such a specific type of gamer and just gave a massive middle finger to the rest of us. Even Dark Souls fans are not gonna be happy with this. They don't like any of this junk. This is like for Diablo fans. It's a completely different game now. But to be fair, if you are that type of gamer, I may have just found your favorite game of all time. I'm not alone in my anger towards this DLC, but in most forum posts online from people like me, you'll always find a few gamers who have played Neo before, posting that meme where the guy's about to be hanged and he's like, first time? Apparently this is exactly how they structured the DLC for Neo 1 and 2. And that's the perfect segue into something I've wanted to get off my chest for a while. This is a call out. I planned on bringing this up in my review of Dissidia Final Fantasy NT, but I held off because I knew the same developers made Stranger of Paradise and I wanted to make sure to get the full picture. Well, I got it. So I'm ready to dunk on Koei Tecmo. What is Team Ninja Koei Tecmo's sick fetish with making games as grindy as possible? Why does their main focus as developers seem to be we gotta inject as much filler as humanly possible into everything we make. Have you played a Dynasty Warriors game? What they do is they make 15 or so stages, a handful of enemies, and then they duplicate them thousands of times and says, there's your game. I think I beat Hyrule Warriors story mode in like five hours, then proceeded to do all the side content for like 200 hours, which was just like, playing those 15 levels again and again and again. That was back when I, for some reason, was okay with wasting that much of my time playing something I didn't like. So when Dissidia Final Fantasy NT forced me to grind repetitive missions simply to access the story, I was gonna put this rant there. But I'm glad I waited. 
I have never played a game by this company that didn't eventually severely disappoint me by wanting to waste an enormous amount of my time, and Stranger of Paradise is my favorite game they've made. Again, the base game, totally fine, I recommend it. But don't get the DLC unless you're one of those sickos who's into this stuff. Or if you want access to guns, that's still really nice, I do love those guns. I'm not the same person I was back when I carelessly dumped 200 hours into mashing B through every level of Hyrule Warriors, so nowadays I just do what any sane person would do. I cheese it. There's a side mission that yields a decent pull of dragon coins, and what you do is you go in at the highest enemy level, you turn on all trials of the Dragon King, Bahamut difficulty, and just run past every enemy. You'll get through it in a few minutes, but it still wants you to fight two big enemies at the end that are basically invincible to you at this level. But you can push them off the cliff, killing them instantly to win. So just do that over and over and over and over, and you'll have enough coins to finish the story, which is just a couple conversations with Bahamut until he finally fights you. You also get to fight the OG Warrior of Light, who I always love to see. These two bosses are the only actual new things they added in the DLC. So what do you get for beating it? Another conversation with Bahamut, where he says, Cool, I'm looking forward to doing this again in 2000 years. The end. Of the first DLC. Finishing the Trials of the Dragon King gives the player access to the second DLC, Wanderer of the Rift, which focuses on everybody's favorite Rift Wanderer, Gilgamesh. He, for some reason, is causing the unraveling of dimensions and you gotta stop him. So those dragon coins we made you grind for? They're worthless now. Now you gotta grind dimension points. You get those by playing the same level over and over. Uh, yeah, you know the drill. Actually though, I have to give this DLC a little more credit. It's technically a new roguelike mode that gets harder as you go, but also lets you work on a temporary build of all sorts of different abilities. You choose between a few different portals based on how difficult the challenge seems and if the rewards are worth the risks. You're still going into levels you've already played, but at least it's in a different context. The longer you live, the more friendlies will show up in the hub area. Each of them can assist you in different ways, altering your equipment or giving you stat boosts or increased rewards or something like that. This is the type of extra content that would be cool to play around with. You know, providing the difficulty curve works like a normal roguelike. Oh, I forgot to say this mode is only accessible if you play on the new Gilgamesh difficulty level, a mode for players whose peerless skill has surpassed dimensional boundaries, putting them on par with the fiercest fighters across dimensions. Okay, how about this game? Every time you pull this shit, I'll just cheese the game even more. It's about time I mentioned extra mode. You can enable extra mode on any difficulty. It's a handicap that gives you infinite break damage and infinite an MP. That's pretty darn overpowered. But if you don't do the grind, you'll still be taken out very easily and you still don't really do a ton of damage to things, so it's not like a free pass. Plus it doesn't make grinding easier either as it limits the rewards you might receive if it's enabled. But you're crazy if you think I didn't enable it. You can cheese the difficulty, but you can't easily farm points like in the last DLC, making this the longest venture of the three. You have to climb 21 floors of this tower, which for me meant grinding through about 60 levels. And if you die, you lose points, and if you lose too many, all of the friendlies you've employed will disappear. Not that I really needed them in extra mode, but if you were playing this legit, that would end your run and you'd have no choice but to start back at the beginning. Oh, and getting hit will also reduce your max HP now, which is another death sentence if you don't find an item that fixes that. I mean, how masochistic can this game get? As a Gilgamesh fan, fighting him in this combat system through a battle on the big bridge is just the type of fan service I show up for, but it wasn't a real fight because I cheated. I cheated because that was the less miserable option than the other, which was the even longer grind and suffering through the now very, very, very hard mode. They put in extra mode as a solution for those who don't want to stomach this circle jerk of item leveling and material farming, but it's not a solution. It's just a different kind of boredom, albeit a much faster one. What I mean is, I'm not experiencing the fun of this game no matter which way I choose. Either play the game 
for 80 to 100 hours and burn myself out to have a fair fight or just turn on extra mode and get through it with no fair fights at all. So after climbing 21 floors and fighting Gilgamesh six times, you find that there's a greater enemy who's truly traveling the dimensions and Gil wants to team up with you to stop it since he knows you, or at least he knows the garland you'll become. The real final boss is the Death Machine, the infamous super boss from Final Fantasy 1, and the fight is insane. At least it looked like it would have been insane if I played it as intended. But then the day is saved. Garland and Gilgamesh part ways and you are granted access to the third and final DLC. When beginning Different Future, keen-eyed fans will notice from the crazy font that Final Fantasy II is going to be involved. Well, someone got word of the great almighty power of chaos and is trying to destroy this dimension in search of it. Time to track him down. Different Future actually includes one brand new level, like a real, full level as big as the other 15 included with the base game, but it's not based on any of the other main lines. This is Lufenia, or at least what Lufenia looked like before the first game. I guess it was a cyberpunk neon paradise before Jack came along. Oh, and it's only accessible through another difficulty setting, Lufenia. A mode for players who wish to transcend to a realm even the gods cannot reach where only the most ruthless survive. How about I just make myself invulnerable to damage? What then? This is the popular exploit everybody uses to blow through all this. Remember job affinity bonuses? Well, the knight has a particularly useful one. If your equipment reaches 400% knight affinity, you gain immunity to all damage while Lightbringer is active. That's that rage burst thing that gives you infinite break. Well, extra mode treats you as being in Lightbringer permanently, therefore you can be completely invincible with this. Now let's beat the game. Different Future also provides the production value that was absent in the previous DLCs. It has the most lore and answered the main question I had about the game. If this is a prequel to Final Fantasy 1, where does Dissidia fit into the equation? Sit update? A little Moogle companion guides you through the level. Strange, since there hasn't been any of those in the game before. He tells you he's from a place where warriors across dimensions fought, and one of them was named Garland. You remind him a lot of Garland, but you're not the same person. Raise your hand if you kept up with your Dissidia lore. The Sid from that game is pretty much the entire reason the game even happened. Chaos is his son. He created a mannequin clone of his image to become the Warrior of Light. It was a whole big thing. But in the end, Chaos had him banished to a nightmare world where he was turned into a Moogle. The same Moogle theorized to be helping out the Warriors in Opera Omnia. So it's not confirmed, but I'm gonna say this is Sid. Even if it's not Sid, one of the friendly monsters who helps you in Wanderer of the Rift is named Sid Tonberry, so there's still a definite Sid in the game. The level is also filled with mannequin versions of monsters, but this is all supposed to happen before Dissidia and Sid of the Lufane and the clones and the mannequins and all that. The timeline doesn't quite make sense, but here's how the ending plays out. The intruder looking to steal power was none other than the Emperor, aka the main villain of Final Fantasy II. But he was just a distraction, so you kill him. You're really hunting down this Lufenian lady to take revenge and become the true god of Discord. But she sends Omega after you just to fit that reference in there right at the end and you kill that. Then she's like, no Jack, don't kill me, no, you'll never be free if you do this. And Jack's like, shut the fuck up. All right, now it's time to get back to the throne and await the Warrior of Light like I've been wanting to. And the Moogle's like, wait, you could make a different future. No one will remember you if you do this. You'll just be fantasies. And Jack says, I don't care. This is ending A, which leads into Final Fantasy 1 for real this time. The true last level is ending B, where Jack goes along with this different future. The Emperor sweeps in to gain the power for one final battle. You deal with him by stripping all his power away until he becomes a normal person again, and then you fling him back into his dimension, which was a hilarious sight. In this ending, Jack accepts the Moogle's offer and ascends to full godhood within World B. 
the world of Dissidia. So there's two different timelines. Characters from timeline B went back in time to influence these events while timeline A is already a loop within itself, but only after the loops of the stranger timeline were altered, but before the split happened. And timeline B also becomes a loop that ends with the Warrior of Light being sent back in time to start timeline A. Ya yeah, know what, just don't worry about it. Oops, well, looks like we spent a third of the video talking about DLC. If you skip that part in a quick nutshell, the first DLC is all grinding. The second DLC is technically a new mode, which is kind of cool, but it's still all grinding. The third DLC is actually a new level, but you do have to play all the other ones first, which if you want to do it legitimately, you have to play it on very, 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 very hard mode, which takes like a bajillion hours, or stupid baby easy mode, which takes all the fun out. They basically made the typical post-game, like, extreme difficulty super boss type stuff and made it paid add-on content. And they also added power creep, which is why it gets so grindy, and oh my god, I just can't get over the- they had a perfectly normal game and then they made the conscious decision to add power creep. Alright, we're done with that. We're done with DLC. Rain it in. Rain it in. Gotta get the DLC out of my head and come up with a conclusion about just the base game. This game is awesome. If you're a Final Fantasy fan and you skip the spoilery parts of this video, you're in for such a treat. If you're a fan of Nomura and, and Nojima style stories, get ready for another wild ride. If you're looking for another Souls-like, this is one with a lot of interesting mechanics that go way deeper than I ever thought they would. I think this will go down in history as an underrated Final Fantasy classic. People already kind of stopped talking about it, but like, I think it's one of the best spin-offs in the franchise. With this and Dissidia NT over with, and with Opera Omnia dead, will Koei Tecmo's partnership with Square Enix continue? Does Jack have another story to tell? I can't imagine what that would be given everything we talked about, but leave it to Nomura, am I right? I've already given my unfiltered thoughts on Koei Tecmo. Love this game. But maybe for the next entry in the Final Fantasy 1 franchise, just give it to someone else. Just try someone else. That's what I would do. That's just what I would do. Here's an idea. Have Square Enix develop it. Anyway, can you believe we've covered 35 years of Final Fantasy? That finish line is just... It's right there. Or should I say, the final bar line. Next time on Rep Void, it's a return to theater rhythm. A much more casual trip down memory lane, a musical adventure, eh, it's just what I need right now because this one was a bit rough. And perhaps we'll see our friend Jack there too. <laughs>